Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Anthony Dayton, Tamer's Chief Product Officer and the moderator for this panel discussion. <clears throat> and you're going to hear from two great speakers who will look at how automation can help with the data problems that pretty much every organization faces. Uh, Andre Vargas is the head of data at the talent agency, Creative Artist Agency, better known as CAA. Uh, and he's gonna provide a firsthand account of how someone who's using automation to improve customer data and in turn make better business decisions. Um, I imagine that improving the quality of customer data uh, to get better business outcomes is a challenge that many of you, many companies face, regardless of what industry uh, you're a part of. Our second panelist is Mike Stonebreaker, a name that many of you attending this session, I'm sure, uh, recognize. Mike uh, has revolutionized the field of database management systems. Uh, he's the co-inventor of the Ingress Relational Database System. He is also an entrepreneur who's helped found many uh, companies. And he teaches at the MIT uh, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. And last but not least, he is, of course, also a Turing Award winner. So he'll help us with a kind of academic perspective on why automation can uh, deliver, can make sort of really a step change improvement in how organizations deliver data uh, and clean and curated data that they require. So thanks both uh, for, for joining us today. Um, maybe I could start with you, uh, Andre, uh, and maybe sort of set the scene a little bit for how CAA uses data. And maybe to start, you could give a little bit of a, an overview of, uh, of what CAA does. Um, I'm sure everybody knows CAA's customers, but they may not know CAA and the role that CAA plays in bringing us, uh, you know, wonderful and enriching content and, and experiences. But, but share what CAA does and why customer data is so important. Of course, and thank you for having me. Yeah, so CAA may not be well known to anyone outside the media and entertainment business, but yeah, if you watch TV or movies or go to concerts or watch sports, or uh, the news, or uh, uh, you will uh, definitely be seeing and listening and, and cheering for one of our clients. It's interesting how you called our clients customers because uh, uh, we'll get into this later in terms of data, uh, but our job is that of a talent agent. We represent actors, directors, producers, athletes, um, uh, broadcasters, uh, newscasters, um, uh, bands that go on tour, those are our clients. Our customers are actually the people who use those services like a studio or a promoter or a team. So we have kind of like two flavors of customer, right? We have the, the clients we serve, but also the buyers that uh, uh, acquire their services. And our job is to get the most opportunity for our clients uh, and you know, supply what the buyers need when they're producing content. So that is basically our job. So it's, uh, uh, you know, if you see a commercial with uh, George Clooney, uh, CAA was part of that. If you see a movie coming up with Tom Cruise, CAA was part of that. Uh, if you go to a concert with Lady Gaga, CAA put it in place. So that's uh, basically the, the job of the agent. So now, this feels like maybe the the least data oriented business you could imagine. This is all about relationships and like feelings and you know experiences and uh, and and especially the physicality of it. Of course, these these events occur in a place. Uh, these concerts have a time and a date. The the people are by their nature people. Uh, and it would seem to me, you know, naively that this is not at all a data business. Um, and yet, uh, uh, you know, we've talked about this before, you know, at its core, every business ultimately is a data business. Um, and and you've, you've spoken about this before and, and, and maybe you could share kind of the role data plays 
in media and entertainment and why you know your industry is transforming away from being a press the flesh business to a data driven business yeah you you got it exactly right it is foremost a uh, relationship and connections business right it's uh, there is always a tight personal even emotional relationship when you are dealing with an artist who wants to be in a particular type of project so data is not going to replace that right um there is this thing also uh, in art you have this intuition right so you 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 have a feeling this is a great band or this is a great art actor we are not going to quantify that right so uh, so at caa to you know be able to introduce more data and i'll explain why data is important as well in in, in a second we created this you know so for us the acronym ai is augmented intuition right so instead of artificial intelligence and scare everybody out in in the media and entertainment business we supercharge what the agents are already really good at right now what is happening is it's a business that maybe you know x years ago there were fewer studios fewer agents and now you have a ton of producing companies netflix arrived netflix is data driven you have spotify is data driven so you're starting to see a lot of tech companies getting into media and entertainment and then bring with them their data driven decision making on what gets greenlit how many seasons they're going to have or not have and we need to match that right because we're not going to show up into a negotiation on behalf of a client and not be loaded with data as to why our client's project is the best uh, opportunity and the best project for that particular buyer, right? So the agents have that intuition. They know what's going on in the marketplace because they have those connections, but it's an ever increasing uh, data-driven business because of the entrance and the way that the world is evolving. So all those negotiations, the opportunity matching uh, become much uh, bigger than you know, we as humans can count, right? So if I had 10 clients uh, with 10 opportunities and 10 buyers, I can deal. But as those buyers increase and those opportunities increase, and especially now with the streaming wars, everybody's looking for more content. What project belongs to which which um, streamer? So should it go to Netflix or HBO Max? Why HBO Max and not Peacock? So now the questions are slightly different and data helps in reducing the time it takes for agents to, make, to maybe make a decision or, oh, I didn't think of Anthony as an option for this particular movie. So he seems to be a really good fit. Let me get Anthony in the movie. Um, so identifying and expanding areas of opportunity for talent and for buyers is where data comes in. Uh, so it's not really to kind of like do the agent job. It's, it's literally, you know, reduce that time to insight. It's uh, having access to all this information. Agents have used information always. In, in, in the past, it could have just been, what's the number one video rental in August, you know, uh, and who's in it, right? So there's always the chase of, who are the up and coming actors? What are the movies that are successful? Longevity and, and, and so on. So as we get more sophisticated, you get more data and then you get into how do we keep it simple and supporting intuition without overwhelming it because there's way too much data to, that we can use today. So it sounds like the, <clears throat> the connection here is that there's just more opportunities there are also probably more types of talent. Uh, and, and as you've expanded the business, you're looking at other kinds of uh, uh, opportunities for clients, et cetera. Uh, so I think generally we think about this problem as the data variety problem. And it sounds like this is a central challenge for CAA. Um, and my, my sense and my guess is that your internal data is sort of one big and important challenge and source that you have. Uh, but then there's also a whole set of external data. And in particular, more recently, that external data has become increasingly important. So things like social media, so you mentioned streaming services. Uh, you know, I'm sure there are other pop culture sources that I'm not familiar with. 
Um, so maybe talk a little bit about the data variety challenge that you, you've had. Yeah, um, that is literally our, our biggest uh, problem that we had to solve um, over, the, you know, over the last three, three four years um, when we um, decided to take this approach. Typically, you will see in media and entertainment, in studios or other agencies, you will see uh, research teams. And research teams have access to a multitude of data source vendors. And then they compile data from different places and create decks, or they'll do like a, a nice presentation or come up with some insights. We decided that that was not going to be scalable uh, as a serve as an internal service to our organization because the business is is growing, and if if you have a research team, your throughput is linear, right? So if if you if you double the amount of reports you need to generate, you need the double amount of researchers to provide those, um, and then all these data sources are silos by themselves, so they can go to a data source to look at Instagram data. But then they'll go somewhere else to look at popularity data. And then they'll go to a different web page to see what the INDB uh, or the Rotten Tomato score is. So you have to go and plug all this information into like manually into a, a beautiful report. And, and, and everybody does a good job of that. We decided to say, no, what, what if we actually could pipeline all of that data and put it into a cloud platform? Because now we could traverse you know, if we could unify our clients across all these data sources. So if I have Anthony, my actor client, and, you know, you like, you are a musician, but you also want to act, well, I'm going to need data about your touring performance. So internally, I will know every tour you've ever done and how many tickets you sold at what price and what day. But now I also will know where are your followers because I have your Instagram account and your Twitter account. So now I can say, oh, okay. So it looks like you have a lot of fans in this market. You've never played there. What are other markets like that market you've never played? And how well did you do there? And then because now I've unified everyone, I could say, okay, so who else is like Anthony who have played in that market that have similar audience followers and then I can do that matching. But that can only happen because now I aggregate everything together. And Anthony has, uh, I have access to every data source that Anthony exists in. So you could be in a movie, I know your movie performance. You, if you're in TV, I'll know your streaming performance. If you are in social media, I know your engagement rate and how much fans follow you, which could help me sell you on a commercial. So the variety of data is, is uh, vast, but it's also why we said we're going to differentiate and that's how we're going to scale because an, an analyst is just going to, in a push of a button, get a 360 of Anthony relative to others like you so that I can see where you stand out versus having to go to a multitude of data sources and one by one get data from you, but then it's not contextualized with others like you or competing artists, right? So in terms of variety, you, you're, you're correct. So there's social media and they always change and added new ones. When we started this project, we had a Twitter and then Instagram arrived and now TikTok has arrived. So we are continuously looking at where is pop culture going? We need to listen, right? So we need to listen to what are those followers going after because they give us signals of what it is that they like and what who else do they follow and, and what brands they like. And all of that supports uh, us understanding your audience. Um, and then if you're in movies, well, I also need to understand every movie you've been in, how they've performed, if it's in streaming, what's the viewership behavior? Is it binge? Is it uh, week by week? Um, what genres do you play in? Um, who is like you. So if, if you're not available to a movie, I can provide somebody like you that will bring a similar audience with a similar track record. Um, and if you're a music artist, I need to know where people are listening to your music. Where, where are they streaming your songs the most? Uh, uh, where are your followers? Are they correlated? Is it just because of, pop, you know, 
everybody is going to go to New York and LA. That's proportional to population. But everybody has markets where they over-index. So we are trying to identify through the data since it's all unified. I will know that maybe you over-index in Tennessee and you didn't know that relative to other artists like you. And then you should probably go to Tennessee uh, and, and play a concert at a particular market. So the variety is everywhere. So anything, you know, and then you have uh, athletes, you know, there's athlete performance, right? So there is, um, um, how are they doing in their teams? You know, what's the history of that? How is that relative to their contracts? Um, so there's uh, a tremendous variety in our business, which obviously will never get bored at CAA working with data because you go, and then you have internal customers too. You know, we also have to do analytics on finance, on human resources, on our corporate side of things. So, so there is uh, a lot of variety uh, uh, and our, our solution was, uh, since we have three main, I would say, players in our business, right? So like, like I mentioned earlier, we have our clients. This is the artist, the band. Uh, they are one, so we need to do a 360 on our clients, right? Um, we also uh, have the projects. So is it, is it the movie or the TV series, uh, the commercial endorsement? That also needs a 360 because we need to understand all aspects of, of the actual project that we're going to make a deal on uh, or renew to a new season if it's a TV show. And then you have the buyer. You need a 360 of the people who buy the work of our clients. So we need to understand everything Netflix. We need to understand everything HBO Max and, and so forth. So uh, we actually have these three pillars unified across all the data sources that give us data on them. So that's, that's uh, what our strategy was early on. So, so you've, you've definitely convinced me that the, the talent um, industry is, is, a, is now a data business. So uh, a tremendous volume of data and, and a tremendous variety. And, and more importantly to your earlier comments, it's data that's changing all the time, new sources. Who, I would never have dreamed up TikTok in a million years, probably should have. Uh, so, you know, like it's, it's gonna change all the time. So uh, just bringing you into the conversation, Mike. So, so here we have uh, uh, a, a tamer customer struggling with an enormous volume of data, huge variety of data, large numbers of sources, and they're definitely not static. And so, you know, what would you advise uh, for this? You know, how would we help Andre get a handle on all this enterprise data? Uh, and you know, is this uh, do we hire a, a bank of people to build rules, or is there a better approach? <clears throat> well, let me let me just uh, restate what uh, Andre said. So <clears throat> his problem is he has, he has clients and there's no unique identifier for clients. So I'll just use me as an example. So I am Mike Stonebreaker. Uh, I'm Michael R. Stonebreaker with an extra E thrown in because people misspell my last name all the time. Uh, I'm M Stonebreaker, I'm just Stonebreaker. <clears throat> so when Andre talks about unifying clients, he has a problem that they are not uniquely identified ever. And so he has, he has a problem of what we would call people mastering. Uh, well, his clients are people, so he needs to master his clients. And that is a difficult task at scale over large numbers of data sources. Uh, similarly, he talks about projects. Uh, my favorite example is uh, Star Wars. So Star Wars versions, uh, you know, V6 uh, is also called the Enterprise Strikes Back. And uh, there are a bunch of other names that are used for that particular piece of content. So again, uh, he has to master what I would call content. And that is really not uniquely identified. Uh, and so you might even, Star Wars might even be identified as George Lucas number six. Uh, and so, 
at scale, he has to master content and master people. And the problem is that if you try and do either of these with the traditional technology, which is to use a bunch of rules. So for example, in terms of mastering content, you could say, uh, if the name of a piece of content, if the edit distance is less than a certain amount from another name, then they're probably the same thing. So uh, this, is, this does not apply to, to CAA, but one of the other uh, content uh, owners that I'm aware of, in fact, is just is trying to do this with the traditional technology, which is write a bunch of rules. So of things like edit distance less than this, if there's a INC on the end, we'll drop that off. Uh, if you know, drop off the A's and ands. And so master, he's mastering content or this organization is mastering content. And they wrote 200,000 rules over 13 years at a cost in excess of $5 million. And they have a nightmare uh, because you need a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of rules in these complex domains. So the traditional vendors all say, and those are people like Informatica, IBM, Talent, all say, well, just, just use some rules and that'll solve your problem. And the issue is that rule systems just don't scale to these complex worlds. So Andre is a genius. Uh, he didn't go there, or at least he didn't go there uh, he didn't tell us if he did go there because that, that's almost guaranteed to fail. So at scale, you've got to use a machine learning approach, which is what Tamer does. There is no other alternative that will scale. So if you need to, uh, if you need to do integration, unification of a few hundred things, use whatever technology you want. If you want to integrate or unify millions of things, then come see Tamer. Because ultimately the, the machine learning based approach uh, is the only one that will scale to the kinds of, of, of variety and volume of, of data that we see, for example, uh, at, at CAA. And so Audrey, maybe, I mean, you could comment. So uh, improving the quality uh, you, you know, you, you've used this approach to improve the quality uh, of your data. Um, maybe talk a little bit about why um, why you picked a machine learning based approach, and um, and I'm, I'm not sure if you actually did have experience trying to do it alternative ways using rules. Uh, maybe comment on that as well. Yeah. So um, for us, we had the privilege that we were giving the the green light to build our data platform of the future, right? So we didn't have a legacy to migrate from, we could say day zero, uh, what would then be an optimal target architecture that will be scalable um, uh, for the future? And one of the strategic decisions we made as we constructed not only the team, but the platform was, we didn't wanna have uh, what I would say like an ops team which is why we also went uh, all cloud. Uh, uh, we wanted to have a subscription and a console. We didn't wanna have a, an admin and a team of admins. And the same approach would be for the data mastering. Uh, CAA uh, at a, as, as a data team, we are, we're a tiny operation relative to the amounts of data that we work with, right? And that's because we wanted to be in the cloud and automate everything. So when, when we decided to use machine learning for data unification, that was perfect because let the machine do 80, 90% of the work and we finish it off rather than us do all of the work because uh, we were never going to spend 13 years building uh, sets of rules. Uh, and, and, and Michael said it perfectly like the, uh, the every, data vendor we have spells even 
titles of TV shows and movies differently. Like Nielsen uh, has abbreviations and this other has an ID, but there's like 27 IDs for the same title, but there might be the version in Asia that has a slight different title because the, it wasn't culturally aligned. So the variety of even just matching a name across data sources, you can't even put a rule to that, right? And, and some of these titles are in uh, fonts that are uh, Chinese fonts or Japanese fonts or, or whatever those other things are. Uh, so uh, no way we were gonna have a team of five people mastering and managing that data is not possible. So since we didn't wanna build a team with a lot of you know, engineers and, 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 and data masters and rule builders, we wanted to go for the automation of it. So we wanted to you know, have a console, uh, subscribe, and, and go from there. That was our strategy from, from day one. So, you know, automation is the way that we make uh, unifying data uh, tractable, achievable, uh, and sort of free people's time. But maybe Mike, if you could comment, uh, especially like almost from a, a theoretical perspective, why is it that machine learning is more uh, or less time consuming, more time effective? Why is it work faster? Because it, you know, intuitively, it seems like a few simple rules get you there, uh, it would be super fast to, to code them up. Uh, what is it about machine learning that, uh, well, maybe what is it about rules that, that fail so hard, but also in a positive light, um, how is it that machine learning can free people's time? Okay, sure. So, so I think and Andre, said it perfectly, which is in, in his world, it would just take too many rules to figure out, to resolve all the unification opportunities. And, uh, and so the answer is a human can in a reasonable amount of time grok a few thousand rules. And if you, if you have a problem that's solvable in a few thousand rules, meaning it, it figures out everything that needs to be unified together, then go for it, use a rule system. But if you, if you think you're gonna write more than a few thousand rules, then you're headed into rule purgatory, which is where this other example that I was referring to is because, uh, when you have way more than a few thousand rules, then progress slows down to near zero. Everyone, uh, Andre said it perfectly, has to add new data sources like TikTok. Uh, and that requires in a rule implementation, writing a whole another new set of rules. So this other uh, particular shop uh, takes six months to a year to add a new data source. And so that just doesn't scale. Why does machine learning scale? Well, the answer is you provide some training data and training data are things that match. And uh, you can provide them because you happen to have, have it hanging around. You can provide it because uh, you hired some folks to uh, say what matches what. Uh, you can provide it by writing some rules that will generate example matches. So however you want to do it, you provide some training data and then a machine learning system takes the training data and builds a model that then, uh, uh, that then decides all, all of the unmatched data. So you only have to using rules or other techniques, uh, match a little bit of the data. And then uh, you can use machine learning to automatically match the rest. So the answer is it scales because you only have to have a human or a rule system look at a little bit of the data, like five to 10%. And that's because uh, while there's a tremendous variety of data, the, the, the variety is, is sort of a tractable variety. So once you can you know, sort of label enough of it, now the problem is just scaling that across the vast corpus of data that the, 
in this case, CAA, but or any, anybody else has, has uh, in, their, in their environment. That, that's correct. And, and machine learning uh, can infer things that are very difficult to express in rules. Mm -hmm. So it's just a more powerful technology. Uh, I wanted to pick up briefly on what Andre said, which is uh, besides choosing machine learning, his other piece of genius, it, <coughs> excuse me, is to go directly to the cloud. Because uh, he said it, he said it perfectly. If he ran uh, unification on prem, then you need an, an ops team that keeps that stuff up. Uh, you need to have system administrators keeping, keeping the hardware up. And the whole thing is no one wants to do that anymore. No one wants to run a data center. Moreover, if you do it on the cloud, then Amazon or Google or Microsoft is providing the, the system administrators, but all of them will also allow you uh, elasticity, which is if at the end of the month you need to run a big job, then uh, get 20, 20 processors working on your behalf. The next day you have no work at all and one will be fine. So you can elastically scale up and down as your requirements change. You can't do that with an in-house data center. So Tamer is basically betting the ranch that everybody will follow um, Andre and to the cloud. And we have a very sophisticated cloud offering uh, called Software as a Service, which is you don't have to install anything. You just plain show up and start, uh, and start training your model or use one of ours. So the cloud is in everyone's future and Andre is ahead of his time in picking up on that. So before we get to Andre's use of the cloud, uh, because you know clearly Andre is bought in, but but I often hear a lot of objections for, for people using the cloud, uh, you know, around issues of security or cost, uh, and you know, uh, you know, resource utilization, and and how how do you think about that? Uh, you know, Mike, is the, should people be scared about running uh, significant workloads on the cloud? Well, let me, uh, with my other hat on, I'm on the faculty at MIT, and uh, Anthony mentioned uh, I'm in a lab called the Computer Science Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, and we, we run an on-prem data center, and the administrators, of which there are several, claim that they that their data center is cheaper than than if we had moved the whole workload onto the cloud. Uh, and that's technically true. However, they don't pay for floor space, they don't pay for power, they don't pay for air conditioning. So so the economics are not a level playing field against the cloud. If you, if you consider all costs in, in some uh, reasonably you know, actuarial way, the cloud is guaranteed to be cheaper. Uh, why is it guaranteed to be cheaper? Well, Amazon and Google are running data centers with millions of processors. Uh, MI, you know, MIT CSAIL is running a cloud with thousands of processors. There's just huge economies of scale. So if, if there's no externalities, uh, then the cloud is guaranteed to be cheaper. Uh, also, the cloud vendors are in a race to the bottom. And so the cloud will get cheaper and cheaper. So I think cost, cost if, if you... If you have a situation where you don't pay for stuff, then by all means do whatever, whatever is cheapest. Uh, but if you're paying, if you're paying full freight, chances are the cloud is cheaper and certainly will be cheaper off into the future. Uh, lots of people bring up security, 
Uh, in my opinion, there is no possibility that your in-house data center is more secure than Google or Amazon's data center. That just, they, they, they view this as a serious business. Uh, you are hiring uh, computer operators that you're paying uh, reasonably small amounts of money to. Uh, and so they make configuration errors at way more frequently than Amazon does or Google or Microsoft. So I, I don't have the data in front of me, but I think if you were to compute the number of security violations per hour per CPU, uh, per unit of processing, uh, they would be wildly uh, more secure than whatever you're doing in-house. So I think the, the, arguments, the arguments against the cloud are in my opinion, rapidly dissipating. And so I would, I would view it totally as a business decision. Uh, and the thing that you should also realize is that if you're running an on-prem uh, data center, you have a whole cadre of people whose vested interest is to keep their jobs. And your, vet, your vested interest is to uh, do IT at the cheapest possible cost. So rem remember to discount whatever the in-house uh, uh, wizards have to say. So th that is, uh, so it's both more secure than, than many organizations uh, could reasonably stand up themselves and less expensive. Um, I love the, uh, the the example of MIT is less expensive if you exclude many of the, the costs, which is, uh, 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 I wish I had that opportunity. So, um, <laughs> so uh, but maybe Andre, uh, coming back to you, what what's, I mean, you, you know, uh, CA is, is running in the cloud. Um, why don't you share some of your perspective on why doing machine learning for data beautification in the cloud is a particularly good good idea, what benefits you've seen, and, and maybe comment on, on Mike's perspective on security and cost. Yeah, so Mike's obviously is spot on. Uh, one additional thing that I would say that when, when we were doing our cost calculations is, I don't know if it's gonna work with this, but if, uh, if I know I'm gonna use this much capacity and I'm gonna run my, uh, my uh, you know, my platform in-house on-prem, then I have to buy servers to know that I'm gonna, you know, in my peak usage, I need to have enough capacity for that, right? So maybe once a week I do a peak, but then nothing else, but I need this capacity for when that peak happens, right? So I'm gonna have to pay for all this capacity in-house forever for those peaks in the cloud, well, it turns on and it turns off. So I'm not, it's like, um, it's metered. So I don't have to pay for the idle time. Um, I don't have to upgrade boxes. So when new processors come up or more memory is needed or whatever, I don't have to switch machines uh, and plug them in and out. Uh, but the biggest uh, thing for us, uh, our strategy was to be, we wanna be a business centered data analytics, data insights organization, right? So we didn't want to have the, the foundational operations and the infrastructure, or none of that. We wanted to spend the brain power and the money that we had for our team specifically to support the agents. So agility is what we value the most. So there is an opportunity cost if I have to ask my ops team hey, I'm going to run a job and they're going to be like, well, it's going to take me two weeks to procure the box and I have to install it. I've lost four weeks for my experiments. And since we are a data science organization as well, we do experiments all the time. Sometimes we, not, we may not need to use a lot of resources, but then a, in a week's period, we're running 17 you know, uh, experiments and we're maxing out, but then it goes down again. So that agility to be able to just do it when it's needed saves us weeks and weeks and weeks of time. And, you know, I'm a big believer in early discovery of rework. So if I do my experiments up front, I'm also saving myself long-term 
uh, impacts of failures or it took me too long to the experiment or I lost an opportunity. So agility is uh, what, what I think the cloud gave us the most because all of us only think in the business problem and not on building the infrastructure, maintaining it, enhancing it or any of that. And yeah, CAA takes security incredibly seriously because of the clientele we have. So we were early adopters of the cloud um, and uh, you know, there's a multitude of tools. We do have a security team that is also cloud first. So all of our uh, tools, all of our servers, um, you know, there's uh, two factor authentications everywhere, uh, multiple uh, uh, mitigation, uh, uh, our, our chief security officer uh, basically says it, I just wanna be mildly annoying because nobody really likes the, the, the extra steps that you need to, to do to stay secure, but they're necessary also. You know, we're also seeing a spike globally about all these uh, cyber attacks. So the company is very well aware and we do have a dedicated cybersecurity team that are constantly um, you know, paying attention and it's, you know, they're all cloud tools and there is cloud tools for security and, and, and all of that. So I'm not an expert in that space, but I know I feel safe uh, with, with our cybersecurity team. So going back to this point you made about elasticity, I think it's a really uh, important one. I just want to connect two ideas here. Uh, you know, Mike, you brought this idea of machine learning uh, as a key enabling technology for bringing data together that it, you know, that it can scale and do, uh, do work that's simply impossible to do in a series of rules. Uh, but it also strikes me that it's also a, a, a kind of um, highly uh, bursty type uh, workload. Uh, what's nice about a rule system is that it sort of, it doesn't work, but on the small one does work against a small volume of data is a very even workload. But machine learning is the sort of thing where you, you know, there's a very heavy burst of work that occurs every time you bring this data together and then it goes away. Um, so it's uniquely suited to running uh, in, in cloud environments. Um, I, I hate to disagree with you, Anthony, but, but the real problem that Andre has is he has a, he has a production system that's running. A, a new data source comes along and there's a big burst to train, train the model to deal with that new data source and then to match that data state. Uh, then in steady state, he needs much less resources. Uh, so it is very bursty. Uh, and and that, that is inherent in, in, a, in a machine learning model. It's inherent uh, in unification. However, the same problem exists with a rule system new data source comes along, you have to figure out all the rules, then you have to use those rules to match all the data, that, uh, that's a spike, uh, then you're done and you're back to steady state. So it's a bursty environment either way. Uh, the big difference is that machine learning does a much better job uh, and, and much more scalably. Fair, fair point. So they're both bursty, uh, but uh, you know maybe the one of the, the key dimensions to bursting your rules is spending six months recoding them, uh, which maybe just bursts in this much slower <laughs> cycle uh, of, and very human uh, human driven. So I, I want to sort of wrap us up a little bit here uh, and talk about some of the value you've seen, Andre, uh, out of getting a handle on your client and. Uh, uh, customer data. And because I think everybody uh, in the session, you know, every company, every business has customers, hopefully, and, uh, you know, and are thinking about ways they can, they can get a handle on that data. Maybe share some of the, the business value that you've seen at CAA of really becoming much more of a, a customer centric organization, the value you've gotten from that. Yeah, so, um, so remember in, in media and entertainment, you're also dealing with artists, right? So you're dealing with artists. And uh, one of the things that they love to see uh, is how is my project going? You know, am I gonna sell season three of my TV show and, and so on? So the data has really helped 
with that because sometimes in a in a non data driven period of our business, uh, you had Nielsen and what the studios said, right? So 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 now. Uh, you have the Netflixes of the world who don't share any data or HBO Max who don't share any data. So you don't know how well is your project going, you know, uh, who's watching, how many people, um, uh, you know, should have a charge more and we're leaving money on the table. So the data has helped us be better negotiators by having higher visibility into these deals, especially with companies that themselves are much more data driven. Uh, We've also, uh, uh, you know, it, it helps us uh, uh, sign clients, which is a competitive advantage because we live in a zero sum game, right? So there's only one Tom Cruise. So if Tom Cruise is a CA client, he's not a client of another agency. So, uh, and, and if demand for Tom Cruise goes up, you cannot produce another Tom Cruise, you know? So there's only, there's only one, right? And uh, uh, that's, you know, having the ability to demonstrate to uh, the type of clients that we serve that we can serve them better than anyone is a huge advantage. You know, um, seeing them and their managers, how we know more about them and their audience and the performance of the shows than anyone else gives them confidence that not only is this agent a good guy or, 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 or she's a wonderful negotiator, but they have the data to really, I feel comfortable when they go to battle for me. That's, the, that's where, where we see a lot of the value. And obviously the matching, right? So we, we care about authenticity, right? So uh, there is always this talk with artists. It's like, oh, he did a commercial for Coca-Cola. And there was this whole thing in the Euros when Cristiano Ronaldo removed the Coca-Cola and said, drink water instead, right? So <laughs> the, 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 what happens there is that Artists and celebrities also want to be authentic, right? So if Cristiano Ronaldo drinks a Coca-Cola, he's being inauthentic because he literally treats his body as a temple, right? So there's only purity going into his body. So he would not make a commercial for Coca-Cola. So our data helps us do that matching in a way that is aligned to what his followers believes he's into, right? So He's not going to do that type of commercial. So he'll do a commercial about something else that is more authentic and it will feel right to the audience that follow Christian. So that opportunity matching that is authentic, the better positioning our agents to negotiate uh, with, with the counterparts that, that buy our, our, our clients' work, and then demonstrating to our clients that there's no one better than us in serving them. Those are the three key areas. Another one too is, you know, it's also a zero sum game in terms of the agents, right? So having the best tools and the best platforms for our agents to be successful means that they'll be most successful with us. Uh, so it's also a really good tool that way. Yeah, so it's a war for talent and you wanna provide the best infrastructure for your employees or agents uh, to That's make right. the best relationships uh, with your customers, with, your, uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the client and therefore, um, you know, the data sounds like it's the real competitive advantage uh, for pulling that off. Um, and maybe um, kind of end on a very practical note, um, and maybe both of you could comment, we could start with you, Mike, uh, giving the audience some really practical uh, thoughts about, you know, how should they think about automation in the context of cleaning up enterprise data? How should they think about machine learning? Uh, maybe there's some holdouts in the audience who still haven't been convinced by Mike that they should take a machine learning based approach. Um, but, you know, are there practical advice you would give folks? And, and Andre, I'll throw the same question to you after Mike uh, gives us his thoughts. Uh, sure. So I think T Tamer has done hundreds of projects uh, like the one Andre describes. And I, 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 I instruct people embarking on this journey uh, to learn from the people who've gone on before. And the first thing, please, please do, do not try and boil the ocean in one swell poop. So you have a gigantic unification problem. Uh, try out your, your easiest version of it, meaning the one with the cleanest data 
So dip your toe in the water. Uh, and when that's successful, then take a bigger bite. So uh, proceed incrementally. So just for example, General Electric uh, GE wanted to unify 75 supplier databases. Uh, so they didn't do that by trying to do all 75 at once. They tried unifying two of them that worked out okay. They tried unifying two more and so forth. So proceed incrementally, because if you try and boil the ocean, chances are you will fail. Uh, the second thing I would say is hire some machine learning talent. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't have any, uh, hi hire somebody. If you, uh, and I know Google and, and Facebook and Microsoft and Amazon get first dibs at, at the best talent. So that may be a difficult proposition. If you don't have machine learning uh, chops on, on, on your staff, then hire, hire external uh, talent that knows what they're doing. Uh, most of the client, most of Tamer's clients use our help, at least at the beginning, uh, to get them up to speed. So get higher expert talent, either internally or externally, and proceed incrementally. So Andre, I mean, the same question to you, you are uh, closest to the practical reality of what it takes to use uh, automation to improve the quality of data and using Tamer and you've done it. So you know, what, uh, what advice do you give people? Yeah, so I agree with, with Mike. So we also started, you know, experimenting. So we, 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 we like to experiment and try things out. Uh, again, you know, it's uh, reducing the rework cycle through, you know, quick, quick experiments uh, and learn and adapt. Uh, beyond everything Mike said, uh, I would say, uh, you know, have realistic expectations. It's not a silver bullet. It's not, it's not going to do a 100% match. Uh, you know, there's always going to be some human interaction. I think that was one of the main things uh, that that we wanted uh, uh, from Tamer is that human plus machine, right? So let machine do the heavy lifting and you finish it off as a human. So understanding that there's still going to be some uh, human intervention and continuous improvement and learning. The moment that you add a new data set, you need to kind of like retrain, you know, because you have new things coming in at all times. Um, so it's not a, I don't think for us, it's a project that started uh, on day zero and finished in day 60. It's a continuous uh, process because our data sources and, and, and the growth that we're going through never stops. So it it's becomes part of your job. You know, it, it's, it becomes your team plus uh, this process, right? So you have to absorb it in, in, in how you get organized. And it's not a silver bullet. That's my other thing is, you know, understand that uh, uh, it, it gets you 80, 90% of the way there. And then, uh, then you finish it off. That's how, how I like to say it. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you both. Uh, some, some great thoughts, uh, both from a very practical perspective, Andre, as someone who's done it, uh, really gotten tremendous business value out of getting a handle on your, on your data, taking a machine learning based automated approach. And from the uh, sort of theoretical and academic perspective, Mike, the, you know, the, the idea that there, there simply is no better way to do this. It's not physically possible in a rules based model. You have to uh, turn to machine learning. And then I think both of you shared this perspective that the cloud is a powerful enabler. Uh, it, you know, the cloud is both more secure and more scalable and more elastic than anything you could do on-prem um, and provides a foundation for actually making uh, this technology work in a very practical sense. So thank you both for the time and uh, to the audience. Thanks for your time and attention. And uh, we'll look forward to connecting later.